Well, Paul, welcome to this conversation series, The Future is Calling Us to Greatness. Thank you, Michael. I have been looking forward to this actually for years, long before I uh, conceived this particular conversation series. Uh, you've been one of my heroes for two decades now uh, in terms of, I'm a longtime student of Thomas Berry and Joanna Macy. And one of the things I've been inviting all my guests to do, even people like yourself who most people will know of, is to just help us get who you are in terms of your uh, your contributions, uh, what you're proudest of. Uh, this isn't a time to be bashful. Like there, there may be some some folks that are part of this series uh, that uh, are listening or watching that may not be familiar with your work. So if you could just help us uh, really get who you are, what you're most committed to, and um, and sort of how you got to this place. Not not your whole story, but certainly uh, the last couple decades since the ecology of commerce. Mm. Well, that's true. <clears throat> I'm, I am a shy person. I, I generally <laughs> have a very hard time working on my bio. And I, f I forget huge swaths and things that I've done. And people will say, oh, but what about that? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Um, and I, I don't think it's a virtue. I don't, I don't think it's even humility. I think it's just some intrinsic um, uh, weirdness of me where I just don't look behind me. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't mean I don't make reflection, self-reflection. That's different. But I mean, in terms of the past, once it's done, it's done. I keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, you know. And rather than uh, repeat the past or write son of book, you know, or daughter <laughs> of book, which is, you know, people will take on a certain flavor or, you know, modality in the world. And then they'll just reinforce it. They'll brand themselves. Yes. I mean, literally yes. brand themselves. And they'll have websites that tout themselves and... <clears throat> And I, I tend to think, you know, if I can just be here and help <clears throat> and make it a better place, if I leave and nobody remembers me, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that because it, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. I really, I don't, I have a friend who's very well known um, and uh, he's called the Starkitect. <laughs> the Starkitect? Uh, yeah, yeah, because, I mean, he has... Two communications people working for him full time, you know, oh, and wow. you know, putting the message out into the world about who he is. And I think one of the things that I've learned early is that you know we're no one at all, and that gives us that freedom and that ability to see and receive and understand and and act, you know, rather than thinking we're a big self. Yeah. You know? yeah. I was going to say your heroes are Thomas Berry and Joanna Macy, and they are both my heroes as well. And for that for that same reason, and that is they just. Uh, I look up to them so much as people who have really done the work on themselves. Yes. I can't claim to, I, I can't claim to have done that, by the way. I, but I know it when I see it. I think, and and those people I see real heroes and heroes um, in in a, in a way that really is going to persist over time in terms of their contribution. My own contribution has really been to um, be a questioner to really try to understand <clears throat> what's going on around me i think i've been confused since i got here and in and i think it's a very confusing world yes. Uh, yes. and so my first company for example is called airwan which is an anagram for nowhere is backwards <laughs> because i really thought that wow this is nowhere everything is upside down and backwards and that was the theme of the samuel butler novel the 19th century which mm -hmm. was just a whole send-up of you know, industrial England. And so I had that same experience of like, this doesn't make sense. I'd read the Wall Street Journal. This doesn't make sense. You know, I'd listen to the news. This doesn't make sense. I mean, I can understand the logic and the rationale that was being put forth. But in terms of the impacts that business and people and myself and what we're doing and the values that we espoused, that, that the impacts they were having on the world just didn't make sense. Even, I mean... Get right down to it. Gym didn't make sense when I was in junior high school. <laughs> the boys snapping each other with towels and, you know, just that whole weird, you know, mm. hierarchical male energy was like, what in the fuck is going on? <laughs> and uh, even though I was a guy, you know, I just, right. I had like real gender confusion then in terms of, well, I, I'm a guy, but who are these guys, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And why do they act this way and talk this way? Where, where do they learn it? Where do they get programmed? Who are their parents? Mm -hmm. And so to see that <clears throat> world that was um, basically um, 
expressing itself against the values of life, compassion, kindness, generosity, um, was a world in which I tried to make sense. And so my first business was in natural foods, and I chose it to be a business only because I found it more easily doable than, say, a co-op or a nonprofit, but not because I was interested in business. I knew nothing about business. And um, so that was really came from having asthma all my life and then curing it by eating food and 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 going back and saying I I, I don't want to be a food fattest you know, I don't mm-hmm. want to have a limited diet I I want to eat whatever I want and then just spending a year going back and forth and realizing that <clears throat> just had a profound effect on my well being health and mental well being and then thinking that gosh other people are going to figure this out too and then starting a natural food company so <clears throat> and I really started it because I wanted a place to shop. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it wasn't so much that I was trying to, sure. um, you know, be a big business person. That was 1966, you know, and so, and by the time uh, I got, got seven years later, we had 30 plus thousand acres under contract that were organically grown and uh, that hadn't been prior to that. Wow. And so this is in 1973. Um <clears throat> and I learned so much about farmers and farming and land and soil and uh-huh. and crops and food and nutrition. Just such a blessing. But after seven years, I left that. I wanted to do something else. And somebody once asked me, because I started a business around fluid dynamics um, based on biomimicry. And they said, what do you know about this? I said, nothing. And uh, <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> why would you do something that you don't know anything about? And I said, why would you do something you already know how to do? Exactly. It was I just and I didn't mean it right. to be impertinent or cute. I just like, well, the whole reason I'm doing this is because I don't know anything about it. And I feel that way about all the books I've written, which mm. is each book is sort of like being paid to learn mm-hmm. because the publisher gives you an advance and then you <laughs> uh you know learn a lot and then you write about it. And mm-hmm. It's not that there isn't a great passion or interest or, you know, already there, of course, there's a fire. Um, but then you organize those around uh, a, a, an idea for a book and then you write it. And so each of those books that I, I've written and the ones I'm writing now have been a sequence of, of, of really exploration, of learning. Mm-hmm. And I think going back to the natural food business and really thinking, gosh, if, if I think other people are, 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 are trying to figure this out too. You know, and if I can help make it clear or to see things in a way that allows them to recognize what they already know, because yeah. re- recognize means already known, already mm. understood. So to recognize something is actually to see something that was obscured, but which you already knew. And so I think great writing, or even good writing, is really about uh, pointing out people putting things in words ideas and concepts into words that people already know yeah yeah well it's funny you should say that because connie my wife and i as you know have been living all over north america for 12 years now uh speaking in churches and colleges and universities and stuff and the most common comment that we get after our programs because what we focus on of course is sort of the intersection of science inspiration and sustainability and the, by far, we get this comment three or four times as often as any other comment, which is people will say, you know, I've never heard it quite put together the way you've done, yet I've always known it's true. Exactly. Exactly. It's like yeah. this deep resonance with our nature. I, and I think that's when I first encountered Thomas Berry in 1988. That was my sense was that, oh, my Lord, here is the, the story of my atoms and my molecules and the environment and the, just everyone and everything. And it just helped make sense of everything. And then, of course, it lit a fire because when you get the big picture, you realize how radically unsustainable the direction that we're headed. And uh, so it's sort of a a boot in the butt to say, okay, well, what's my legacy? How am I going to make a difference given my unique gifts and my unique limitations? Mm, Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And and I like I'm doing two books now on climate and carbon and uh, first time I've done two at the same time. But but. It really comes from going back to 1976 when at SRI with Peter Schwartz and Jay Ogilvie, I was first introduced really to this climate change. And Mm -hmm. I've been watching it. We, you know, befriended Bill McKibben in in early 90s and and watched how how it's 
out and have not really said much about it. I mean, certainly mentioned it in my books, but not sure. really t- talked about it in a global way. And so for the first time, it takes, you know, I'm going to write about it. And the two books are Drawdown and, and Carbon. The, but, but, but it really comes from years and years of thinking, observing, listening, watching, reading, studying. And then, do I have anything to say? And, and most of the times, I don't. People say it better. But sometimes, I have a, a, a way of looking at things that isn't being expressed. Mm-hmm. And then, when that happens, then I'll do a book. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to want to ask you, because there's a few things that I personally am more excited about than Project Drawdown and uh, and that whole enterprise. Um, but before we get there, if we could, uh, I just, again, for people who aren't familiar with um, sort of what I consider to be three books that are just so timeless, I recommend them to anybody listening to this conversation now. Uh, the Ecology of Commerce, Natural Capitalism, and Blessed Unrest. So if you could just say a little bit about each of those. Sure. The Ecology of Commerce um, was written in 92, published in 93, um, and was a uh, New York Times bestseller. And actually, it's published, I think, in 28 countries now. No, 28 languages, excuse me. Uh, in the world and basically it said something that was really rather well it was anathema at the time which is that <laughs> that, that, that the business could make a very profound contribution to <clears throat> healing the earth and at that time business saw the environmentalists as the problem regulation and mm-hmm. environmentalists certainly saw business as the problem and it still is um, and so to write a book with that title um, managed to alienate both sides for a while, you know. <laughs> I lost, but I'd been in business and I tried to express myself in business from the very first time I went into business with natural foods in an environmental and social responsible way. And so for me, they didn't seem different. And um, that book, um, the prior two books, Growing a Business and the Next Economy, had been reviewed by publications everywhere every business publication reviewed both books mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 200 reviews each and then the ecology of commerce came out it was reviewed three times dunn's business week and <laughs> they got another and, and the editors killed the review there was only one oh my gosh done by michael palekia at the dallas uh, news or some dallas times Herald. i forget the, the paper in dallas but there was a business writer who reviewed the book it was a pariah book and <laughs> Uh, uh, it still went on to be a bestseller, but you know, it just showed you the business was not interested at that time. The irony is that you know, 18 years later, I mean, Walmart so was pushing it to all its associates, wow. you know, and saying you should read the book. Um, but so that book came out, and basically, it, <clears throat> um, it bridged a gap that is uh, no longer gap really you you know but at the time it was heretical natural capitalism came out later 99 written in the first article i wrote of that title was in 96 it was for mother jones and the question i was asking and trying to answer by asking it was what happens when natural capital is the limiting factor to human well-being because the limiting factor to human well-being up until uh uh, the industrial age was, you know, housing and transport and food and, you know, just the the basics and the, the industrial a- energy. The industrial age really changed that and uh, dramatically um, with great consequences, both positive and negative. And um, but in the process, it was using up all our natural is is continues to use up all our natural capital. Yes. And natural capital is all those resources and assets and pollinators and ecosystem services that are not on the balance sheets of the world, you know, but actually provide life on Earth. Well, well, what what E.F. Schumacher, I believe, called primary goods as opposed to secondary goods. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so that was published in Mother Jones in 97. The editor, Carrie Tremaine, and I said, well, how do we title this article? And then we said, well, this is called Natural Capital ism because it was about natural capital but we thought the play on words would definitely tweak the mother jones readers <laughs> and it did it did and he got fired by the board <laughs> oh jesus but it, it really wasn't it you know people thought it was an apology for a capital 
Oh, it had nothing right, to do with right. it whatsoever. It was just a play on words. And to this day, that <laughs> plagues it because when I came out with the book with Amory Levins, he loved the title. And, and I said, no, nah, it was just a, we do, we're just having fun when we named it that, but it stuck. And uh, so, but it's, I just want to tell your listeners, it is not about capitalism. <laughs> it's about natural capital. It's about natural capital, the primary goods, like uh, mm-hmm, what, mm-hmm. what the entire yeah. human economy is based on. Exactly. And then what is an economy that is actually honors it? Yes. You know? yes. And, for, and not just honors it but actually increases the amount of it. Right. I've said recently to the q and I said sustainability comes down to a very simple point. You're either increasing life on Earth or decreasing it. It's it. It's mm-hmm. binary. Mm-hmm. Let's move on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but so natural capitalism is very, very much about increasing the of natural capital in the world, not about increasing capitalism. Yes. The third book, um, Blessed Unrest, uh, really emerged from years of doing what <clears throat> you and Connie do, which is to talk to people and go out and give, you know, sharings and lectures. And and um, and I've been doing that for a long time. And in the process, as you know, and I think everybody knows, that people have business cards to give them to you. And, um, <laughs> I'm swimming in you, business cards. I know. I have stacks <laughs> right now, the recent stuff. Yes, no, I know. I, I don't know what to do with them. and um, But I kept them all. I never them away and at that time i'd been on the board of you know trust for public land and friends of the earth and Mm -hmm. conservation international and so there's this sort of feeling you have in the big um uh environmental ngos that you know nrdc wri i mean you get this well that's you know we're we're it and um you the g the g10 (laughs) as it's called and but and they meet together and you know they do wonderful things sierra club i mean things but what struck me when I was out in, out in colleges universities and cities and towns and conferences was that I, I didn't recognize the NGOs that were being presented to me name after name after name right, after right. name after name and that's when I began to wonder and question the uh, how many there were like well what's going on excuse me out there there is no out there but at the time that's kind of what was my thinking which is wow there's a lot going on on the ground that we don't know about, mm-hmm. and and who's we? It was these larger, you know, NGOs, and so um, I got at one point I had a shopping bag full of cards, and it, really, literally, mm-hmm. and and I, you know, would come home and lay them out, look at them, and go, huh, okay, there you go, and put them in the shopping bag, and so then I started research, and I grew up at the University of California, Berkeley. My father taught there in the library. And Marion, the librarian, was a hero in our family. And so I went to the library and said, okay, I'll find out just how many NGOs, environmental and, uh-huh. and social justice NGOs there are in the United States. And I couldn't find out. And then I went to try to find out in Europe and other countries in the world, and I realized there is no way to know. And we don't know. Yeah. And so, I, but I kept sort of doing the research, and and then I was um, uh, at the um, WTO protests in Seattle 1999, and I didn't go there to write about it at all. I went there just to be another body, but ended up writing about it just because what was written about it in the popular press, you know, the Time and in Washington Post and New York Times was just so flagrantly, <clears throat> ridiculously uh, wrong and, and yeah. mis- misguided and really not present. The, the, the people who are writing about it, like Krugman and others, mm-hmm. um, not Krugman, excuse me, Thomas Friedman right, and others, right. were, weren't even there, you know, and they had, they, but they certainly took strong positions. And uh, so I wrote a piece about it, but the thing that struck me about the Seattle protests was the way it was organized, because I had been in the civil rights movement, the anti war movement, and I said, this is not the old male top down hierarchical way that these uh, movements were organized and I sort of tried to figure out how it was organized and it went back to the the encuentras that were done in 90 and 1992 to um, by the indigenous and first peoples of uh, South Meso and North America to um, really um, get together from the quincentennial 
of the conquest, you know, mm-hmm. of the, the genocide. Uh, and um, it was a Mayan form of organization, and that, again, began to um, uh, raise questions in my mind, is like, what's going on here? How is this happening? What are mm-hmm. the lines of communication? How is this um, being organized? What It seemed like there was a movement uh, afoot in the world that not rise to the surface very often in terms of say Seattle yeah. but was very very powerful and that's when I started to um, uh, think about blessed unrest and 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 do that book so it took about seven years to really gather information it took only a year or so to write it but but it took about seven years to just you know listen gather talk research mm-hmm. um, and during that time um, started wiser earth and we we did we, we researched and one of the things that came up which is in the appendix of the book, is the the typology or the taxonomy, really, of the movement. Yes. And there's three there's three thousand roughly different things that the movement is doing. It's just so beautiful. It's like life itself, so nuanced and granular, yes. and and specific. And the movement is often criticized for that. You know, it doesn't know what it wants. Yes, it knows what it wants. It wants everything. <laughs> it, <laughs> it wants to increase life. Up. Earth and to make this, you know, a planet based on compassion, kindness, generosity, and you know, potlatch rather than greed, fear, yes. and 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 so it, it does encompass everything because it's a systemic approach to the problem, yeah. and it's manifest everywhere. So that was blessed unrest. Yeah, well, th- that's great. That was a fabulous overview, and I just want—I actually want to read a paragraph. Uh, from Blessed Unrest, um, uh, I think it's on page 194, because it just so perfectly captures the essence of the way I end my program. I've done 100 speaking engagements uh, across the United States this past uh, this past year in support of the Great March for Climate Action. We started in L.A., and that, that's when I began these, uh, these Skype interviews uh, in March and uh, have been interviewing folk ever since. And at the end of every program that I've done, Um, I say, you know, that there is a, well, first of all, I quote Carl Sagan. Um, Carl Sagan says, how is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded this is better than we thought? The universe (laughs) is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, subtler, more elegant. God must be even greater than we dreamed. And he says, how is, uh, he says, a religion old or new that stressed the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by the conventional faiths. And then he concludes, uh, and he says, sooner or later, such a religion will emerge. And then I pause, and I say, now, I think he was correct in the intuition and dead wrong in the detail, because it's not a religion that's emerging. It's right. a set of values, priorities, and commitments. In fact, I, I would say it this way, that a worldwide meta-religious movement has been emerging for decades, largely unnoticed, at the nexus, the intersection of science, inspiration, and sustainability. Beliefs are secondary. What unites us is a pool of common values, priorities, and commitments regarding living in right relationship to reality and working together in the service of a just and thriving future for all. And then I'll pause for just a couple seconds and I'll say, now, I'm not the only one saying this. And then I show your book, Blessed Unrest, and I quote both the the subtitle of the soft cover, and then I always say, I actually like the subtitle of the hard cover better. How the largest movement of the world came into being and why no one saw it coming. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So, so I want to just uh, quick read this one paragraph that's just a fabulous overview. You, you say, it's axiomatic that we are at the threshold, at a threshold in human existence, a fundamental change in understanding about our relationship to nature and each other. We are moving from a world created by privilege to a world created by community. The current thrust of history is too simple to be labeled, but global themes are emerging in response to cascading ecological crises crises and human suffering. These ideas include the need for radical social change, the reinvention of market-based economics, the empowerment of women, activism on all levels, and the need for localized economic control. There are insistent calls for autonomy, appeals for new uh, new resource ethic based on the tradition of the commons, demands for the reinstatement of cultural primacy over corporate hegemony, and a rising demand for radical transparency in politics and corporate decision-making. It's been said that environmentalism failed as a movement, or worse yet, died. It is the other way around. Everyone on Earth will be an environmentalist in the not-too-distant future, driven there by necessity and experience. Bam! I love it! (laughs) (laughs) I have to... uh, That that paragraph... 
choreographed is inspired by Rick Tarnas uh, oh. and Cosmos and Psyche. Yeah. Um, That's great. That's great. Amazing, amazing thinker. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, could you please share, because as I, I mentioned earlier in this conversation, that uh, I there's hardly anything that I'm more excited about than uh, Project Drawdown. So say a little bit about that, both the, the writing and just the whole project. Sure. Drawdown, uh, the word refers to that time, that point in time when the, the, the amount of CO2 and greenhouse gases in the upper atmosphere are reduced on a year to year basis. So that's what Drawdown is. Um, and the book goes back, the project, it's really a project because mm -hmm. um, hundreds of people's postdocs, PhDs, institutions, NGOs, politicians, businesses are involved in creating it. So it's really a crowd authored book, it's not crowd sourced, it's crowd authored in mm -hmm. a sense that, and I, I want it to be that uh, for a very important reason, I'll get back to that. But it started back in 2001 when the third assessment came out from the IPCC. And as they are sequentially more <clears throat> um, cautionary and, and gloomy than preceding ones, this one was very yes, much so. Yes, exactly. And um, it, and at that time, uh, the carbon mitigation project came out from Princeton University, talking about the fifteen wedges. These were each wedge could uh, <clears throat> avoid uh, a, a billion tons of uh, carbon emissions every year, and if we did fifteen of them, then we could reach you know, climate stabilization. And I read the wedges and um, hoping or expecting actually to be hopeful and, and, and like, wow, we have a path here. And I had the opposite uh, experience. Mm. I felt like, oh my gosh, this, it made me really pessimistic because nine of the 15 could only be done by big utility companies uh, or energy companies. And and one can only be done by a big car company. One can only be done by a big appliance company. So there's 11 out of 15. <laughs> one were agricultural practices that had been espoused by the USDA during the Dust Bowl. And, and two, you could do something about which is to drive less and put solar panels on your house. And I thought, this, we are in trouble. <laughs> After all, you know. Because what we're saying there with that is that the, the fate of the world, you know, basically rests in the hands of uh, boards of directors of huge, you know, um, companies. And I just thought, I hope not, because that's what got us into this place in the first place, is the boards of directors of companies. And so I um, began to go to NGOs and friends and say, we should make a list of all the solutions and do the math and see, we don't know what the math sh shows. Right. And uh, and I kept talking and asking other people to do it. And I remember NRDC and people said, great, great idea, great idea. You know, well, that's not what we're going to do. But, <laughs> and and um, so it was really a year ago, a year and a half ago, with Amanda Ravenhill, who I taught a course on with at Presidio Graduate School. And we were just talking um, about what's missing in the literature. And then I mentioned this idea to her. And she said, well, let's just do it. And I said, okay. <laughs> So we're doing it. It's a, a drawdown.org, and um, you can go there to the website. But but what it does is it lists a hundred substantive solutions mm -hmm. that are in place that we're already doing. We know very well. It's WW Granger. You can buy it now. You can get it now. It's like a gonna be, and that are scaling in every instance that are growing, um, and just going out thirty years. 2045 from 2015 and seeing what the impact will be on carbon emissions mm -hmm. uh, in 30 years and can we achieve uh, down that is to say a year to year reduction because the idea of stabilizing at 550 ppm or 600 or whatever is chaos it's not stability that's a misnomer the only goal that's worthwhile for the 21st century is reduction and drawdown yes, no other yes, goal makes any yes. sense whatsoever so if that's the goal let's name it and then let's figure out how to get there and where we are right now so that's what drawdown is about and what's interesting about it is that the solutions we normally think of as supply side oh solar you know wind mm -hmm. uh, uh, ethanol and we think about efficiency for sure in terms of our buildings uh, and our cars uh, in terms of mileage or even going to electric. But beyond that, it sort of trails off pretty quickly. Uh, and what we realized, Amanda and I, when we did the table of contents, started to assemble and 
sense, the list of substantive solutions, that there is something for everybody to do here. It's a complex problem, but the good thing about complexity and the complexity of the problem, as Andy Revkin points out, the columnist, the green columnist yep, and yep. blogger for the Times, is that there's mm. something to do for everyone. And so the book is organized according to agency, which is this is what individuals can do, this is what neighborhoods and communities can do, and only, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Individuals can't do it and businesses can't do it, just neighborhoods and communities. This is what facilities and, and buildings can do. This is what uh, businesses and utilities can do. Mm -hmm. This is what uh, cities and towns can do. This is what uh, farmlands can do. This is what we can do with our grasslands. This is what forest lands can do. This is what provinces and states can do. So it's organized according to agency where the fulcrum, the leverage point is in terms of of affecting carbon emission uh, <clears throat> strategies. And there's only three things we can do, really. You know, we can change the source of energy mm -hmm. from high carbon to low carbon. Even renewable ones have some co carbon component in their manufacture. Okay, so uh, we can change the source. We can reduce the amount of energy we are using from that source, and that's efficiency. And we can biosequester carbon from the atmosphere back into the soil through our farming practices, our grazing practices, and our afforestation and reforestation practices. And and we need to do all three because mm -hmm. we've got to bring it back home. That mm -hmm. carbon, nothing wrong with it. It's just not, it needs to come home. Um, and and home is right here in the biosphere, um, on the, in, in, our, in our soils. So, so that is 100 Solutions. And what we find is that we come up with solutions that I think are overlooked, clean cooks. It's really, really important solution that not only stops the burning of firewood all over Africa and other places, but uh, improves the health and well-being of the women and the family, the children. Clean, um, clean, what was that? Clean? Cook stoves. Oh, clean cook stoves, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But big, big important solution for, for climate. Mm -hmm. Educating girls in the developing world. Very important yes. solution because yep. birth rates plummet uh, when girls go past fourth or fifth grade. 10th, 11th, 12th grade. And so what's interesting about this is that it's just a, uh, there's a lot of things people don't know about. Uh, air heat pumps, you know, carbon farming. I mean, of course they know about efficient cars, you know, but there's so many other areas so that the book is really has a very clear, clean, engaging description of what mm -hmm. it does, its history, how it works, etc. But it also has numbers. And the numbers are based on extraordinary models that we've developed uh, that really are extremely granular going all over the world and, and to measure exactly the impact these technologies or solutions will have over 30 years with respect to the number of gigatons avoided of carbon mm -hmm. emitted in the atmosphere. Uh, number two, what is their first cost if they're scaled up in the way that we project mm -hmm. what is the net savings or cost which is a very very important number because so often climate solutions on the right or by deniers are portrayed as something that costs society that takes away from the economy that's going to cost jobs it's going to be a, a you know a taxable event mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and in fact what we see and there's no question about it it's it's a it's a it's an investment mm -hmm. and the return is extraordinary i have said you know, it costs nothing when when it when when you get everything back. I mean, yes. that's what's at risk is everything we know. But in real dollar terms, it is a fantastic investment, and so it has cascading benefits. And so there's that. And finally, what we have on the right bottom corner of the page, as you turn the page, you see what the PPM will be in 2045 if this is implemented. You go to the next page, and then it goes down, then it goes down, then it goes down. It's like a flip book. You can go, yeah, yeah. you can actually see what the PPM will be at that time instead of what it would be with business as usual, yeah. um, which is being projected by IEA and other organizations. And all our data is based on, you know, the UN, the IEA, I mean, the best agencies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So everything double, triple sourced. We have, like I said, scholars. We have IPCC lead authors, we have, you know, the best people in the world, I think, working on this, 14 universities, 
so that when you see it, it it's it's not going to be like it's, this is not Paul's idea, this is not Paul's plan, and Paul. Exactly. This this is what we know reflected back to ourselves. Yes, yes. Well, you know, one of the things that it reminds me of, uh, I remember having a conversation not long after I met Thomas Berry, I think in 1989 or something, where he quoted Terre de Chardin around the, his concern that the, the greatest issue may be human energy, that if we don't have the passion, the enthusiasm, the energy, the excitement to do this, if we just get bummed and depressed and overwhelmed and just suicidal about it, then we're not going to have that energy. And um, somewhere on your site, I can't remember where, it says, showing the diverse and beneficial implications of climate focused solutions is the key to reversing apathy and i i that's one of the things that struck me as i first went to the site and was reading it it's that i think a lot of us who are been have been committed to climate change and and uh, you know uh, who are aware of peak oil and some of the large scale challenges and uh, you know, peace and justice, it, we can be overwhelmed with the bad news. We can be overwhelmed with, oh my God, these problems are so large. What can we do? What can I do that could really make a difference? And your book uh, is an antidote to that. I, <laughs> that's why I, I, yeah. I, it's like, here I am interviewing you at the very end. And I wish I could have recommended, actually, I will actually, because now I have communication with these other 50 uh, thought leaders on this. But I, 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 I want this to be an international bestseller because it's just, it's so vital for shifting our energy and giving, giving solutions uh, that are practical. I couldn't say it better. Absolutely. There's a thing called availability heuristics, which is really when you say a word or a phrase, what comes up for a human being? Mm -hmm. What is the thought that comes up? And if you go into a crowded room and say climate change, find me one person in that room <laughs> who doesn't go into fear, yes. anxiety, numbness, uh, disempowerment, uh, anger. Uh, you know, you can name all these sure. emotions. But nobody really goes, wow. Yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> this is going. To, this is the transformation that transforms everything yes. in the world, yes. and that's why I say in my talks now you have to ask yourself: Is climate change happening to you or for you? Because if it's happening to you or to us, that means we're victims and we're disempowered, and something out there is doing it to us and if we say it's for us then we are integrated then it's there's no other yes. and you know it's us and it is the key to in, tra transformation to creativity to innovation to all the things that have been espoused and are being put forth by the very organizations that i you know sort of highlighted in blessed unrest and that we, you, me, and so many other people have been trying to work on all our lives, all our adult lives, if mm -hmm. not before. And so climate change is the transformation that brings us together because nothing can stay the same. And everything we know will be changed and modified into something far better for both all living systems, including human systems, and uh, all the children and families to come so that's why I want to do a drawdown so that when you think about it, you go, yeah, the science, wow. I mean, that yes. that is holy smokes, you know. Yes. It's a fantastic science, really extraordinary, the biggest science project in the history of the world, far exceeding anything that's ever been done before, two billion separate data points going into the fifth assessment. And so, oh, you know, this is extraordinary achievement of humankind now the IPCC itself says we are not so good about really understanding what to do and the solutions. We know they're there, but we are, that's not what we do. And its they don't need to do it. We need to do that because we are doing it, not yes. because we need to figure it out. We are figuring it out, and mm -hmm. we are doing it. And it's, again, one of those unknown stories. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wow, fabulous. Thank you, Paul. Well, there was one other thing that I wanted to ask you about, and it was something that, frankly, I had never heard of until very recently. Um, I've been teaching and preaching about the need to uh, have our economy and products reflect their true cost. And, um, of course, taxing carbon or putting fair price on carbon pollution and all this. Uh, that James Hansen, I interviewed Jim Hansen just yesterday. Um, and, of course, he's been promoting, uh, as I have, Citizens Climate Lobby and the, and the need to uh, essentially uh, have the market work for us. Um, and then I just discovered, the, because it was linked to your Wikipedia page, Pagovian tax. And it was like, wow, how, how could I be completely unaware of this concept? So if you could just say a little bit about that. 
Well, Arthur, let's see, I forget his middle initial, P- Pigo, uh, was an economist who just, you know, in the 19th century, who said that the damage that was being done um, to villages and buildings and <clears throat> by uh, coal-fired uh, industrial plants uh, should be paid for by the people causing the damage, not by the people who were um, receiving the damage. Yes. <laughs> and, and it seemed fair and simple and straightforward, and uh, it became to be known as a Pogovian tax, not very many. They have not been implemented very often, uh, but any... Um, uh, a tax on carbon would be essentially a Pogovian tax. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the you know uh, carbon, however, uh, what is even innovative really uh, is to have you know a fee on carbon and then to rebate it back. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and then you get you have the incentives which are correct, but you also have the reward. Yes, and that gets gets out of the you know no tax or don't increase our taxes, which is most people are going to vote against because they're, they're, they they don't have enough money now, at least they think they don't, and so the, the so Pigovian taxes are really graduated um, to um, <clears throat> uh, instru- instruments, policy instruments that actually reward. Um, and the thing is, if you pay a higher price for carbon, whether it's in your gas or your heating oil for your home, then things that make your home more efficient or that incent you to exactly. incentivize you to buy a different kind of a car, electric car, then actually save you money both ways because you're paying less for something. At the same time, you're, you're actually saving money. So it actually gets people to save money. And as they save money, then they improve the environment, they reduce emissions, and everybody benefits. And we have a situation now which is completely the opposite. Exactly. In fact, the person who said it most succinctly, uh, I quote him all the time in my programs, uh, is Bob Inglis, a Republican from South Carolina. And he says, I... This is a direct quote. He says, I favor a conservative approach that marshals the power of the market and doesn't increase the size of government. Here it is in a nutshell. Put all the costs and all the fuels and eliminate all the subsidies and then watch the free enterprise system solve the climate and energy problem. There you go. Yeah, it's just like, and especially what Jim Hansen and I, I think he's so right, is that when we give that back, when we basically refund that, uh, then people, the, because most poor and middle class people would actually be getting more than they'll be paying, they're going to be incentivized and excited to vote this kind of thing uh, in, in, into being. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Amy and I in natural capitalism made a suggestion which had been made before, which is, you know, basically you do <clears throat> a tax on cars and you do uh, whatever it is, you know, $100, you, you take the average mile per gallon of the fleet. And every mile per gallon under that that a car <clears throat> uh, uh, does, you have to pay a hundred dollars. And if it's you know if the fleet average is twenty two and it gets seventeen miles per gallon, you have to pay five hundred dollars or more mm-hmm. for that car. Now this person who gets a car that gets twenty seven miles per gallon too gets the five hundred dollars. So uh-huh. the, the twenty seven mile per gallon car is cheaper. The seventeen mile per gallon car is more expensive, and and basically you're just taking money from here and you're putting it over there, and you're incentivizing people exactly. to make a super efficient fleet. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Well, Paul, this is fabulous. There's one last question that my wife, Connie, has asked me to ask everybody, and it's just been so fun. I purposely don't let anybody know about it ahead of time, so to just see what, what, what emerges. And that is that if you had the opportunity to have a dinner with any three people in human history, whether it's the three of them and you, or a one-on-one over a you know, beer, a glass of wine, or you know, a hike, or whatever, who would those three people be, and why would you choose them? Oh, well, I'd have a beer with the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Uh, I would probably the Buddha, Emerson, and, um, <clears throat> gosh, was it? two people that come up right away, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Yeah, sure. Uh, and maybe, uh, I don't know, I was like the third person, but um, the Buddha, because I think that he... He has been glamorized, <laughs> and uh, like every religion, you know, has been totemized. 
surprised. And and um, I remember watching a documentary on the Buddha on, on PBS, and people were saying, "Well, the Buddha said this, and then he did this, and then he did this." And I was saying, "How do you know? You know, <laughs> nothing that the Buddha said was even written down for three hundred years until." after he died right. so it's you know it's like a so i i the, you know the, there's a book by um pankaj mishra called the end of suffering which really tried to go back and you know find out well who is he really you know and i would love to to mm-hmm. sit down and find out who is he really i just think he must have been an amazing guy and and uh and, and to make him human again because yes. the, the 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 promise of buddhism is is our humanity not our liberation Liberation is just another kind of duality from between bondage and you know, and yeah. his his ability to really see through dualism and, and then express it is so extraordinary. Emerson and I wrote about in Blessed Unrest, and I feel like he was really a mystic. And it's interesting, Stephen Mitchell, who um, is a friend, and you know, with so many beautiful sure. translations, mm-hmm. uh, Tao Te King, Bhagavad Gita. And, mm-hmm. Married to Byron Katie, but he said something interesting, which I, you know, about how the mystics during the transcendental period, Whitman and Emerson, really got sort of went downhill, but kind of lost um, that sparkle as they got older, and 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 the, and the, the, the many of the Asian sages did not; they actually got more and more. Um, mm. Found, and he wonders if it was because they lacked the practice. They, they actually didn't have it. Oh, practice. that's interesting. It's a very interesting uh, question and comment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I, so I like to meet a younger Emerson when he was just <laughs> looking out there, writing nature, and just I don't know what he was smoking, but it was must have <laughs> awesome. Awesome, you know, what he was uh, just an extraordinary. Uh, the writings are extraordinary. You read them now and look back. And, and you wonder how it even got published um, because they're <laughs> so elegiac and 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 uh, <clears throat> paradisiacal and, and and but but non-dual you know yeah, yes and and, and their thinking um, so well and I'd say the same thing about Jesus I can't imagine actually sitting down and you know over a cold one and uh, and really getting to know the man uh, without all the <laughs> mythology built up afterwards. <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe actually, maybe the, maybe the the third person is is is, is his wife. You know. I oh think, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Mary Magdalene. I think I'd like to talk to her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're she, the second person that has said that in this series, precisely. Yeah. 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 Now that I remember, yeah, like she's going to tell me everything about herself and him. Yes, exactly. And it's going to be a twofer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Paul, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for uh, for making the time to do this. And I just, uh, blessings on your work and uh, your life. May you continue to have good health. Um, and um, uh, the next time that we're out on the West Coast, I'll uh, I'll let you know when we're coming and see if we can get together for a cold one or whatever. Absolutely, Michael. Thank you so much for what you're doing. It's so important. And I just say again and again, you know, people think that, that, that you know there's something small quote quote and it's not important it's the, everything big comes from small things yes. nothing big comes from big things yeah. and uh, except damage and um so thank you for what you're doing i really really appreciate it cool thanks 